Uh, my name is Rob. I work at the Swedish Museum of Natural History. And hopefully this talk is going to give you kind of like a brief overview of some of the patterns we found in the insects that we detected uh, across space and also within their taxonomic families. Um, so I'm just going to jog your memory and reiterate what we mean by an OTU. An OTU is a group of very genetically similar organisms. And in this case for this talk, we can think of them as representative species. Uh, and so this figure here, I'm going to show you quite a few of these figures, and it, essentially what it shows is the distribution of these OTUs throughout a taxonomic tree. So the size of the point and the darkness of the colour tells you how many OTUs you detect in a specific group. So here we have the insects, uh, it's quite a big point and the colour is quite dark, so we've detected a lot of the OTUs in insects. And then if we can follow it down to the diptera, which represent the true flies, uh, that's the largest group within the insects. Um, so one of the most striking results from the, the work we've done so far is how many of um, the organisms we detect don't have a reference sequence matched in the database, which is quite exciting. Uh, it probably means that a lot of the species that we're working with are new to science. Um, but if we ignore the ones that we don't detect, uh, we don't have a reference sequence for, uh, we actually detect a really, really diverse uh, insect fauna. And uh, it ranges from, you know, Something quite simple like a fly, butterflies and moths, beetles, hymenoptera, which are the wasps, bees and ants, um, hemiptera, which are the true bugs, a lot of other insect orders I don't have time to talk about, but then some also kind of uh, weird and wacky stuff like uh, terrestrial arthropods, springtails, uh, spiders and even some scorpions. So the, the insects, the arthropods that we have in the samples are super, super diverse. Um, and I'm just going to take you through a few of these orders now to just talk about a few of the groups we find, just to really illustrate how deep the, uh, the Malagasy fauna goes. So these are the flies. Uh, by far the biggest representative uh, of this group were the Sesamiids. Uh, and these are gormages, which are plants that live in decaying matter, and sometimes they create gall uh, to protect the larvae on, on plants. We also find a lot of fungus gnats, which are uh, small flies that spend a part of their life cycle eating, uh, eating fungus. And then we also have something weird like a tachinid fly, which are these uh, a group, uh, uh, a family of, uh, of uh, parasitic flies. And then we can move on to moths and butterflies. And then again, we find a, a lot of different families. We have uh, the depressed moths, uh, leaf roller moths, which protect their larvae by rolling a leaf uh, in different plants. Uh, owlet moths, which are known for their really diverse ecology, and then some really spe spectacular things like hawk moths. Um, and then if we move on to the Hymenoptera, you might be um, unsurprised to find that we find a lot of ants, but then we also find uh, a lot of different uh, families of parasitic wasps. And if you look deep into the Hymenoptera, you'll see that most of the organisms we detect are parasitic wasps, which is a, um, you know, something that's quite well known, but also uh, quite exciting. Um, so we could carry on, and we could do this for every single uh, order of family of insects, but uh, we don't have very much time, it's only 15 minutes, so I'm going to talk on now about um, some broad community patterns. And one of the questions we wanted to answer is, are we sampling enough with 50 sites? Is that enough to really detect everything there is to detect in Madagascar. Uh, I'm going to compare between Sweden and Madagascar very quickly. Um, and you can, do, you can answer this question by constructing something called a species accumulation curve, which is essentially a method of uh, comparing the number of samples you have to the species richness in your, in your samples. Uh, and essentially, if you look at the curve for Sweden, you find that as you get to a higher number of samples, it begins to level off, which means you're getting fewer and fewer new species detected in your sample. But if you do the same for Madagascar, you see it remains a straight line. So it means once you get to 50 species, if you project that line upwards, you're still going to find more and more. It hasn't begun to level off. So we know that even at 50 sites, we can still find more new exciting insects if we expand the number of sites we have in Madagascar. <coughs> so how many sites do we need? Um, so you can extrapolate out this relationship and say, Oh, okay, so if, if we sample 100, 100, 150, 200 sites, how many more species will we find? And we find that even if we get a comparable level to Sweden with 200 sites, we're still, we're still finding that curve hasn't flattened off. We can still find more even if we sample as much as we do in Sweden, which really illustrates how, how many di like, and how diverse the fauna is here. Um, so 
Oh, sorry, my arrows have popped up before they meant to. Um, how, like, so given that it's really, really diverse, we want to know how is this diversity spread across the country? Uh, one thing you can do, a very simple analysis, is compare um, the dry forest on the west coast to the rainforest on the east coast. Uh, and the first question we kind of wanted to answer is, um, what do these patterns uh, of species riches look like through time? Um, so if you plot the number of species you have through time, what, do the, what does the trend look like? Uh, and you can do this for the dry forest and rainforest simultaneously. Um, so the week of the year is along the x-axis, so zero is January, and then week 52 would be December. Um, and you can see that, first of all, the rainforest has an overall uh, higher number of species. Uh, and then the dry, dry forest has a lower number of species, but also the dry forest has um, a, a, the kind of the trough, the lowest point is later on in the year, where in the rainforest it's about week 30, and the dry forest it's about week 40. So we know the temporal trends are different between the two habitat types, um, but what about the, num the different types of species you find in both? So if you look at the, all of the OTUs we find in the rainforest and all the OTUs we find in the dry forest, and look at how many overlap, we find it's actually a tiny proportion. So the, the communities between these two habitat types are really, really distinct, and there's not very many species that you'll find in both. Um, I'm just going to introduce kind of like a, uh, a measure of dissimilarity so, so we can do a bit more of a formal analysis. Um, so if you take the number of species that you find in both, uh, uh, and then... Um, the number of species you find in all of your sample and uh, divide the shared species by um, all of your species and then subtract it from one. And this gives you a measure of similarity that you can then plot against different environmental variables to see how dissimilarity changes. And the important thing to remember here is that when dissimilarity means equals one, uh, so you can plot it between sites, it means that there are no shared species or all the species you find in your new site are new compared to your old site. And then we can have another, like, another comparison between Sweden and Madagascar. So you can plot distance against this, this similarity metric. So we've got distance on the x-axis and dissimilarity on the y-axis. So it's basically saying, how many new species do you find when you drive 500, 1,000, 1,500 kilometers away from where you started? And you can see in Sweden that if you wanted to find a community that's completely different and there are very, very few shared species, you'd have to drive 1,500 kilometres, which is the length of the country. But if you do the same thing for Madagascar, you quickly come to the same point around one uh, at 250 kilometres. So you could really drive you know, between any national park from east to west, not very far at all, before you find a community that's completely distinct. And this really, what this really means is that every... Uh, National Park in Madagascar is going to have something unique about it. The communities will be neat, unique. Um, so what does all this all mean? I've tried to distill it down into three distinct points. The first is that the, the insects here are incredibly diverse uh, and that every site is unique. The second is that we still need to sample more sites. 50, despite this being the, the biggest ever inventory of uh, insects in Madagascar, um, 50 sites is still an underestimate of the number of species that we'll find. So we need to expand the number of sites if we really want to discover the full depth of Malagasy biodiversity. And finally, it means um, that we need to protect habitat. If we lose sites and we lose forests, um, this number is going to slide down the scale. So we're going to find fewer and fewer um, uh, species and insects in, in the forest. Um, so yeah. Hopefully you found this talk interesting um, and I'd just like to thank you all for listening.